the most difficult topics are ahruf and qiraat and the concept of ahruf and the reality of ahruf and the relationship of the Uthmanic Mus'haf with the ahruf and the preservation of the ahruf. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. Salafis need to realize, and let me be very blunt here, that if Umar ibn al-Khattab was amongst us right now, and they gave him a quiz of aqidah, the fact of the matter is, that test that you put in front of him, he would fail it. A Dilbandi, a Salafi, an Ash'ari, anybody were to quiz him, a first year exam from Darul Ulum, from Medina, from Azhar, from any institution, he would fail in every single subject. When there's a crisis, when the state wants to ban the Sharia, when the government issues something about all Muslims, Sunni, Shia, all of us, we need to come together and we need to have a united stand. There's a time and a place to join hands. There's a time and a place to show unity. There's a time and a place to ignore all of those differences. Does medieval Islamic law prescribe the death penalty? for uh, uh, extramarital sex? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It does dis uh, uh, prescribe the death penalty for extramarital, not premarital. Adultery, basically. Yes, it does. The texts say things that are somewhat problematic at times. You, all religious people know what I'm talking about here, right? The texts have some laws that are somewhat bizarre. And this is all texts. Should they be updated and, and, and modernized? Again, that's an ongoing discussion. And that's one of the main sources of, of intra-Muslim dialogue. Muslims do need to have that dialogue. And, and they are having it. I consider this alim to be one of our fundamental maraji' marji's, one of our main people we look up to. And that is Sheikh Yusuf, Yusuf al-Qardawi. Wallahi, I admire the guy as a towering intellectual genius, as somebody who understands the sharia ah and its applicability in modern times. As an alim, I don't think anybody can rival that type of scholarship. الحقيقة لا علاج لهذه الأمة إلا بالحرية أنا قلت في بعض برامجي أنا أقدم الحرية على تطبيق الشريعة الإسلامية أنا أقدم الحرية على تطبيق الشريعة الإسلامية نتمسك في الديمقراطية ونقاتل في سبيلها نحن نريد بلدا ديمقراطيا ديمقراطية يريدون دولة دينية يريدون والله لا نريد دولة دينية ولا يريد أحد دولة دينية الدولة الدينية مرفوضة عندنا ونحن نريد دولة مدنية أنا أؤيد إنه لا يعني يعمل بالرجم هذا والرجم شريعة يهودية محمد لا يقوم مثل هذه الشريعة القاسية أحب أن أقول كلمة عن نتائج الانتخابات الإسرائيلية العرب كانوا معلقين كل آمالهم على نجاح بيريش وقد سقط بيريش وهذا مما نحمده في إسرائيل نتمنى أن تكون بلادنا مثل هذه البلاد وهذا مما نحمده في إسرائيل نتمنى أن تكون بلادنا مثل هذه البلاد من أجل مجموعة قليلة يسقط واحد عنه والشعب هو الذي يحكم ليس هناك التسعات الأربع أو التسعات الخمس التي نعرفها في بلادنا تسعة وتسعين وتسعة وتسعين من مية وهذا لو أن الله عرب نفسه على الناس ما أخذ هذه النسبة أو أن الله عرب نفسه على الناس ما أخذ هذه النسبة وهذا لو أن الله عرب نفسه على الناس ما أخذ هذه النسبة رجل كان يتكلم عن انتخابات في إحدى الدول وذكر أن رجلا حصل على نسبة 99% ثم قال معلقا لو أن الله عرب نفسه على الناس لما أخذ هذه النسبة أعوذ بالله هذا يجب عليه أن يتوب 
يكون من هذا والا فهو مكتب لانه جعل المخلوق اعلى من الخالق فعليه ان يتوب الى الله فان تاب فالله يقول التوبة عن عباده والا وجد على ولاة الامور ان يضربوا عون الله As an alim, I don't think anybody can rival that type of scholarship. If you're attracted to a certain group of ulama, stick with them. Alhamdulillah, as long as they're mainstream, yaqi, whether you're Diobandi, whether you're Ikhwani, whether you're Salafi, whether you're yani, you know, moderate Sufi, Ghazali, Sufi, all of them, they have khair in them. Find your jama'ah that appeals to you, stick with them, and then be quiet about other Muslims, yaqi. that's not the priority. Choose those whom you feel most comfortable with, and then be quiet about the rest. Simple as that. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab fought decades of jihad in his lifetime. He and his group and army fought other people, conquered lands, expanded their lands under the name of jihad, not under the name of political war, under the name of jihad. Who was he fighting? He was fighting fellow Muslims. Who did he consider these people to be? Kuffar and infidels. His view was that the Ottoman Empire in its totality was a pagan empire. Dawla Mushrika Kafira. And that anybody who supported the Ottoman Empire, ipso facto, automatically became a Murtad or a Kafir. He means the Ottoman Empire. He means the Muslims around him. Whoever considers these people not to be Kafir is a Kafir. Think about the repercussions. And that's why there are plenty of statements in his own writings where he indicates that the only group of people who are truly upon Tawheed are his followers. His notion of wala and bara. And that notion of wala and bara was basically, if you're with the Ottomans, and that means you're not with his group, then you are not just a deviant, you are a kafir. What this individual did in waging jihad and considering the rest of the ummah to be kafir is essentially what ISIS is doing in our times. The same mentality of everybody's a kafir unless it's us. The average third wave Najdi Da'wa student is in denial. No, Ibn Abdul Wahab didn't consider himself to be the only Muslim group in the world. Yes, he did. Go read his writings. It's not surprising that our medieval scholars believe this type of stuff. Now, obviously, dare I say, anybody who knows science and geography and modern civilization, you cannot believe, you cannot believe that there is a tribe for 4,000 years trapped behind a wall. We are all to love the and, 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 and have studied Islamic sciences. Wallahi, I'll be honest with you. The shubuhat that I was exposed to at Yale, some of them I still don't have answers for. But with my utmost respect, I believe that these creeds that we are wed to also have elements of human products in them. Mm. But frankly, the Sunni theological schools are very much akin mm. yeah. to these legal schools. And we need to understand that they are human attempts mm. to get at the truth. And you see the development of theology. I mean, Aqidah in general, the way it's taught and studied from different schools of thought, it's taught as something black and white, something... And every school and teaches dirt. this. Yeah. And, and every school is incorrect in this regard. Mm. Because Aqidah is a development. And you see for yourself that there is an actual internal development. Can I shake hands with somebody of the opposite gender? My position on this is that it should be avoided as much as possible, but in and of itself it is not haram. But in and of itself it is not haram. We need to differentiate between slogans and actual solutions. This is the second point. Differentiate between slogans and solutions. All too often, we fall prey to beautiful slogans. There are groups that say, we must return to the example of the Salaf or the righteous predecessors. And again, it's a good slogan, but they are useless in providing actual solutions. So when you tell me to go back to the past, okay, I agree, we should respect the past, but it doesn't give me what? What does it give me? A solution. The second opinion is the opinion that invoking the saints, it is haram and it is evil and it is an evil innovation, a religious innovation, a bid'ah and it is a stepping stone to shirk. It is opening the doors to shirk, but it is not shirk in and of itself 
unless that action is accompanied by a belief that you're calling out to a God. I myself am now an advocate of this second uh, position. I used to be 1B and now I am uh, uh, very staunchly in opinion uh, 2. And now I am uh, uh, very staunchly in opinion uh, 2. And now I am uh, uh, very staunchly in opinion uh, 2.